With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, it is the loudest story in news and culture and politics. I suspect it will be this way probably for at least a month or so, if not longer. Let's go to one of our legal experts to break it down for us. He's returning to the show. One of our real good friends, Bert Lyko, attorney extraordinaire out in the Portland area. He's also a longtime OG at Ordinary-Times.com. He has one of them fancy emeritus titles, which means he does it when he wants to, and I'm very jealous of him for that. My friend, how are you today? Andrew, I am uh, I am beside myself with what has happened at the Supreme Court, but very very thrilled that you have invited me on your show to talk about it. Yeah, we're we're thrilled to have you. Okay, when I talked about this on the show uh, yesterday, I was basically reading. You sent it to me as an email, and then we turned it into an article because that's how we do things at Ordinary Dash Times on the fly. Sometimes um, you did a quick little write up of it. Let's start with some nomenclature though, because I, I want to make sure everybody's on the same page because we are dealing. We're dealing with one of the loudest cultural things of our lifetime. Uh, I put it this way on the radio this morning. This really is um, the convergence of the last 30 years of the culture wars. This is what everybody's been building for. This is what everybody's kind of been gearing up for. This is this is going to be loud like something we've never seen before. But we're dealing with black and white law here. So let's get our nomenclature right. Roe v. Wade, everybody knows that that's the abortion law. What does and doesn't Roe v. Wade do? And... In addition to that, because it's going to get lumped in here, Casey versus Planned Parenthood, which you you got to have them together to understand the full picture here. Just nomenclature eyes real quick. Just kind of overview those four so we know what we're talking about. All right. Um, you can spend uh, about three weeks on this in a con law class in law school. So I can get deep, deep, deep into the weeds if you like. Um, I would start uh, the, the case history uh, with... Uh, I'd start it with Griswold versus Connecticut. That's a 1967, I think, case from uh, from Connecticut, obviously, dealing with access to contraception. And that case decided that uh, individuals have a fundamental right to have access to contraception uh, based on this notion of a right to privacy. Now, you will search the Constitution of the United States in vain for the word privacy. Uh, It's not there. Griswold used uh, what's called penumbral reasoning, saying that there are certain things that exist within the scope of different enumerated constitutional rights. The First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Ninth Amendment, and the Fourteenth Amendment. And all of these enumerated rights have been interpreted to protect certain kinds of privacy. So Uh, The idea didn't originate in the Griswold case. It goes all the way back. uh, The the earliest formal discussion of it goes to a law review article in Yale Law Review by Louis Brandeis in 1890. So we're not talking about something that the Griswold court made up out of whole cloth. Uh, But it was the first time it really got applied, at least in a very explosive sort of way, in that Griswold case. With me so far. Yeah, I'm with you so far. And real quick, since you brought it up, there has been this all over social media today that uh, Roe v. Wade was essentially a privacy case. That's an oversimplification, even though the basis in the Griswold law was privacy. That's an oversimplification of what Roe v. Wade does as you go on to further explain it, right? Right. Um, It's important to understand that that Griswold case took this idea that Louis Brandeis had about a privacy right being one of the unenumerated rights and put that into law because the Roe court took a look at at the circumstances of that case, a direct challenge to a Texas law criminalizing abortions and said privacy is one of the reasons why uh, we can't have a law criminalizing abortions. That's not consistent with the constitution because among other things, the Constitution protects the right to privacy. Getting an abortion is a very private sort of decision, one of the most intimate private decisions a person could make. So that is one of the foundations that is mentioned in the Roe case. The Roe case also goes directly to the Ninth Amendment 
and says you have a right to an abortion that you can trace just to the Ninth Amendment that says there are unenumerated rights. And the Ninth provides one of those. It didn't do a real good job of articulating what that right is. And this is where the Roe case has got a lot of criticism. Is it's a little foggy on the textual foundation for what becomes a, a limited right to an abortion. So uh, the second thing to understand about Roe is it does not provide an unlimited right to an abortion. Roe creates a, sort of a sliding scale as a pregnancy advances. So in it, it decides and there's no real good legal precedent for it. Uh, it just says that you have uh, a pregnancy divided into three trimesters. Uh, the first one third of the pregnancy, the second one third, the last one third. And as you advance through the pregnancy, the state's interest in regulating that abortion, regulating potentially up to the point of criminalizing it, uh, will, will grow. So in the first trimester, the state has a very minimal interest as compared to the individual's autonomy in deciding whether or not to have that abortion. And then by the time we get to the third trimester, the state's interest has grown powerful enough that it can override the individual's decision. And the third concept that comes out of Roe that becomes important when we get to Casey 20 years after that uh, is this idea of viability. And viability gets to be really the turning point, both in Roe and especially in cases that come later. Viability is defined as the point that a fetus can survive on its own outside the womb. The case does not say what degree of technological assistance is necessary for the fetus to survive outside the womb. And that's another reason that you could criticize the reasoning in the Roe case. As medical technology improves over time from 1973 when Rose handed down to today, um, a prematurely born baby can survive a lot longer because we have better technology right now and, and can be can survive uh, more and more prematurely, I should say. So um, that's that's the basic idea of Roe that you have a um, a sliding scale of the state's interests over time coming to be uh, coming to overrule an individual's interests. And there, there's a, a whole theoretical framework uh, that I have, a number of other lawyers have that, uh, that we, can, we can go into and that's uh, a, a real interesting rabbit hole. But that's the core ideas of Roe. There's other ideas too, actually, but we don't need to get into them today. How hard is it? Because here's kind of the, we, we know the cultural side of this. How hard is it though, when you're talking about the case law and you laid out a little bit of, you know, case law built on case law, it, it's a, it's a building thing. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with this kind of case law, where you're also trying to deal with a medical certainty and a medical certainty that has a very uh, debatable point like viability, we've already mm -hmm. talked about, you know, uh, we normally now uh, 20 week fetuses are viable outside the womb, these sort of things. Isn't there just an inherent problem in trying to do case law with something that even the medical folks can't really tell you a good answer on? And we're trying to give a definitive answer on, is, is it too much to say that this is one of those points of law where the law is just inadequate to try to explain this? And there, there's just always going to be a tension here, no matter what you do. There, there will always be tension about this um, because this is such a morally fraught issue. And people of very, very good faith and very good morality are always going to disagree about this. That will never, ever change. It has never, ever changed since thousands of years ago when abortions were uh, first done with different kinds of uh, chemical inducements, uh, whether that was something that should be done or shouldn't, uh, ancient peoples discussed and debated amongst themselves. Uh, we shouldn't be so arrogant as to think that we will resolve as difficult an issue of this in uh, particularly in these modern times. What, um, before we get into the actual, what Alito is writing on this thing though, compare this to like, and I know it's not a perfect match, but like Europe, there's a pretty set standard mostly across most of the developed countries in Europe. Um, they're usually somewhere in that 15 to 20 week range. We know the Texas law is the 15 week range, which was 
kind of designed to go at the court. We didn't get there because this came down first. Is, is the week, do we get lost in the weeds on the weeks and the viability part of this, or is that really essential to the case law of how this is going to play out going forward? After we get the Dobbs decision handed down, uh, which we can reasonably suspect is going to look a lot like that leaked opinion that, that got put out on Monday, um, viability isn't really going to matter as much at the federal level. And it's going to be more a question of political choices get, that get made on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, I'm sure we're going to circle back around to that. Uh, some states may choose viability as a point. Uh, some states may choose to define viability at 28 weeks, 24 weeks, 20 weeks. Um, and that's going to be based on, I would like to say it would be based on an assessment of the medical resources that are available in that state. But the, the practical answer is it's going to be based on uh, pretty much raw politics. Bert Lyko, attorney, our good friend, a writer at Ordinary-Times.com. He's already wrote about this. Uh, we're talking about the Alito brief, the opinion uh, that some folks are calling it a leak. I don't believe in leaks. I don't think anything's ever a leak. I think this was leaked on purpose. Uh, we're going to get into the actual brief right after we take a quick break. We're going to get into what Alito wrote, what it means, what it means going forward. And uh, he's going to explain it to us like we're five because I don't understand all this stuff. And he's really, really good with this sort of things. Bert Lyko continues with us on one of the loudest topics we probably will ever cover, unfortunately, as her tell continues. Uh, we're back with our friend Bert Lyko. Okay, we have some news now. Uh, you alluded to it. Chief Justice Roberts has issued a rare statement because I don't know how else he was going to do it, but it is rare for the Chief Justice to comment on uh, cases before they come out on opinions. He says this is a legitimate brief. He says it is, uh, or I keep saying brief, it's opinion. He says it's a legitimate opinion. Uh, it is an early opinion. We all know that from the big first draft stamped on the top of it. If you actually bothered to read it at ordinary-times.com and other places like you and I did. Uh, but it's hard to imagine this is going to be very markedly different than what is going to come out in June or whenever they get out to this brief. What's the first thing that jumped out at you about this? Was it that Alito wrote it or was it how Alito wrote it? Uh, the first thing that jumped out about it to me was that I was reading it at all. The last time that I'm aware of in history that an opinion has been leaked out of the Supreme Court to anyone uh, was uh, what the year would have been, I think, 1859, when it's likely the leaker was Chief Justice Roger Taney, who told President James Buchanan what the Dred Scott decision was going to be. And Buchanan went and spilled the beans to the public, uh, talking to a newspaper saying that the Supreme Court was going to resolve the issue of slavery in the uh, federal territories very, very soon, and it would be a final resolution, and there'd be no need to worry about that for the election. Um, students of history will recall that this, um, this worked out rather poorly. Very poorly and very bloodily uh, by the end, of course. Let, let's do nomenclature one more time, though. You're talking about a leak, a breach of trust was the terminology, Chief Justice. This isn't like uh, Justice Kennedy had somewhat of a reputation for talking out of school, out at parties and out on the town, and he would talk about things like that's not what we're talking about here. This is an actual document from the court. This is a bigger deal than just gossip or somebody mentioning something or, or a Kennedy or somebody like that talking out of school at a party or something like this. How big a deal is this that this is one of the draft copies that was going around? The justices pass these back and forth. They go through many rounds of this. We know this. How big a deal is that? Is it the breach of trust that the chief justice called it? So um, let's bookmark going back to, um, uh, to, to the brief being circulated, because I think that's important to understand if you're going to engage in Supreme Court criminology. But um, how big a, a breach of trust is this? Um, it is an earthquake, uh, an earth-shattering violation of Supreme Court norms. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she was still alive, was, uh, was famous for, among other things, saying that if someone in the media is trying to tell you that they know what the Supreme Court's going to do, you really need to 
distrust that. Uh, and, and her phrase was uh, something like, uh, people who say they know what the court is going to do don't know what they're talking about, and people who know what the court's going to do don't talk about it. That's as strong a social norm as um, not speaking up when the minister says, is there anyone here who has any objection to this marriage? No one stands up and says, yes, I object to this marriage. You don't do that. Uh, this is as strong a social norm on Supreme Court as, um, you know, kissing your sister. You, you, you just don't do it. What um, does it tell you anything about how this went down? It went to Politico. Obviously, you know, you don't do something like this is somebody who knew somebody and trusted them. You don't do these sorts of things willy nilly. There's a lot of speculation. We don't want to do that. But does it tell you anything about the way this went down, why it might have went out this way? Do you read any tea leaves there at all, or are you just kind of flummoxed why it happened at all? So I have to give a disclaimer that anybody indulging in this game is going to be doing what I call criminal Kremlinology. Back in the days of the Soviet Union, our diplomats, our State Department tried to figure out what the Soviets were going to do based on uh, subtle differences in Russian grammar from press releases that came out of the Kremlin to say it was this or that minister who was doing this and they have this or that opinion and that none of them had the remotest clue what they were really talking about. What we can know as a matter of fact is uh, the list of suspects of people who could have leaked this information to Politico, both the opinion and the fact of who had signed on to it, why it's written in the form of a majority opinion. Um, there are a grand total of 45 people who could have done that. Uh, the nine justices themselves and each of their four law clerks. Those would be the only people who would know, uh, who would both have access to the draft opinion and know who had voted in favor of it. So um, who is it from there? Um, at that point, you are rolling dice, one out of 45. Yeah, I, I, I suspect we're going to find out pretty quickly for a lot of reasons, um, and we'll, we'll deal with that when it comes out. I do think it matters who does it and why, but we'll deal with that when it comes out. Okay, let's assume, uh, again, since we know the document's valid, let's assume this is pretty, at least without major differences, what's going to come out of the court when they issue this ruling. Uh, let's assume it's a you know, five or six vote decision. I'm assuming it's going to be five, four. Otherwise, um, Alito wouldn't have wrote it because that means uh, the chief justice did not. He's on the other end of the opinion or otherwise it wouldn't have broke down this way. So let's assume it's five, four. Let's assume this comes out in the middle of June or whenever. What happens day one? Because we already see all the hyperbole of what's going to happen. You know, row falls down. That's not like the walls of Jericho coming down and the city evaporates. That's not what's going to happen here. Practically speaking, uh, day one, Roe v. Wade goes down. What practically happens? What legally happens? I'm not sure that 5-4 is a safe assumption. The chief could jump in and, uh, and override this draft opinion. But um, going on that assumption that the chief decides to vote in the minority, uh, what happens on day one is the Mississippi law winds up taking effect in the state of Mississippi. And I don't know the exact number, somewhere between 15 to 20 other states have these kick-in laws that will follow suit. So what's happened with those kick-in laws is the legislatures in those states have passed laws that say, if Roe v. Wade is overruled, this will become the law that governs abortion in, in our state. So somewhere between 15 to 20 states are going to have uh, new, much more restrictive abortion laws that take effect. Several other states are going to launch significant political debates. Well, those debates have probably been launched right now after the leak came out. So there's going to be a significant debate in 10 states about whether those states will or will not restrict their abortion laws from where they're at right now and come up with a more restrictive regime than what Roe versus Wade and uh, KCV Planned Parenthood have allowed. And about 20 other states, the law isn't going to change at all. Uh, these are going to be your more liberal kinds of states that have taken abortion rights and written them into their state constitutions. Uh, my own state of Oregon is one of them. Uh, 
If, uh, if you live in Oregon, this is not going to affect you directly because the Oregon state law is still going to uh, provide for a fairly strong individual right to seek an abortion. Uh, if you go across the border to Idaho or Nevada, it might be a little bit different story. Let me ask you a, a law nerd question for a second, because because of you and our friend Em and a couple of others, I've had to learn how to read these things and read these opinions. <laughs> Something you wrote caught my attention, and I just want you to expound on it for a minute. Um, it is well known uh, that Justice Alito is not the strongest writer on the court. We mean how he actually writes his opinion. All the justices have their own fleur. Um, Scalia was infamous for writing it specifically for law students to have to dig through it, and he'd leave nuggets and stuff, these sorts of things. Um you, I found it interesting that you wrote this opinion. I'm going to quote you here. It's didactic. It's defensive. It's a lot longer than it needs to be. If if the conspiracy theory is that they've planned to tear down Roe all along, I don't. That wouldn't be how you would write that, right? Because you would have this kind of pre-planned. You've been spending all your career trying to. You've been waiting for this moment to write this opinion. What does the style that it was written in? And again, it's consistent with Alito, so it's not like he, you know, did something out of the norm here. What did the writing style of this say to you that you thought to point that out a little bit? Um, part of that was that it had just come down that night and I was reading it fairly late at night and was a little bit irritable as, as I did it. Um, I was right I, there with you, by the way, just for the record. And <laughs> I'm on the East Coast, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so part of it was um, the, the tedium of having to wade through 63 pages of Alito's writing. Uh, so um, that may, that I'm guilty of a little bit of unprofessionalism there, uh, but um, I don't think I'm alone in that. Uh, defensiveness is Alito's signature, uh, both in his majority opinions and in uh, in his dissents. Um, I have analogized an Alito dissent to, um, uh, to to the legal equivalent of Donald Duck having a temper tantrum. The uh, the, the the majority opinions that he writes are uh, a good deal more sober than that. And that's appropriate. Majority opinions do need to be sober. Uh, they need to be at least facially neutral in tone because they're announcing what the rule of law is going to be. And, and Alito does do that. He's, he's, very, he's a sober writer. Uh, he is a logical writer. You can see his logic being built. You can almost take an Alito opinion apart and see the outline that he drafted to get there. And it's very direct syllogistic logic. That's neither good nor bad. Uh, that's, that's just his style. Um, it, I am just always left after reading an Alito majority opinion, like I've just received an overly long lecture from a very disappointed uh, uh, grade school teacher who thought that I should have understood this concept sooner and is deciding to make me feel morally bad for not getting it. Uh, Bert Lyko. All right. Last question real quick on this. We appreciate your time on this talking about the uh, what will forever be known as the Alito draft opinion, I think. Um, how long until we know we already know there's all these kick in laws. Um, I think there's 12 of them are automatic. The other ones they got to go through the legislature. There's about 20 of them all together. I'm sure the blue states they'll have it up uh, before the election this fall. How long before we have federal uh, lawsuits right back in court and we start this process all over again? the day the opinion is handed down. Those that lawsuits fine. have already been written and uh, the lawyers and the parties are just waiting for them to become ripe enough to file them. This has been the case about abortion laws since about 1970. Uh, there's no reason to think that that's gonna change. So this is, I know this is the end of the 40 odd year uh, saga of Roe v. Wade, but as uh, litigation of abortion in America goes, this is really kind of the end of the middle of the beginning of the first, right? We are nowhere near done having legal and political arguments about abortion. This is this isn't going to end while any of us are still breathing air. Well, luckily, we have you, my friend, to continue to talk about it. Uh, I'm sure we'll have you back in a couple of weeks when the actual ruling comes down. We'll see how closely it matches up. Let folks know real quick where they can follow you on social media and at Ordinary-Times.com because I sure do rely on you. I appreciate you. You've been a good little mentor to me as that editor-in-chief emeritus, which means you get to dip your toe in when you want to while we do all the grunt work. But let folks know how they can follow you, my friend. Uh, the best way to follow me these days is on Twitter, at least for the time being. We'll see what happens with that takeover. You've talked about that before. I'm at 
at Bert Lyko, B-U-R-T-L-I-K-K-O. And you can also look me up and find the uh, longer form essays at ordinary-times.com uh, under that name. And he is a august and respected member of the Twitter Supper Club. And boy, do we need that more than ever these days in one of the great food cities in America, Portland, Oregon. Out there, my friend, you keep putting that on your timeline. We sure do appreciate it. Thank you for your time, sir. We'll talk again real soon on this matter. All right, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. Stay calm out there, folks. Again, to our, keep your bearing, folks. It's going to be all right. We're going to get through it. Thank you, sir. 